Hey everyone, my name is Dan Quintana. I am from the University of Oslo. And for the next little while, I want to talk about transparent meta analysis or how to perform your own transparent meta analysis. As many of you would know, the biobehavioral sciences are in the midst of a reproducibility crisis in which a lot of the findings that we once saw as robust do not replicate. And there are a lot of things that contribute to this, but in general, um, a lot of these issues come down to this uh, hypothetical deductive model of science being short-circuited by questionable research practices. Here's a really good uh, illustration, which has been put together um, by the, the, the Center of Open Science. But essentially, there's a number of factors or a number of different questionable research practices. And a lot of the focus has been on how these affect primary research. And of course, that's, that's quite important. But what's often unrecognized is that these questionable research practices also affect meta-analysis. There's a few things in particular um, that we're going to that I'm going to be focusing on, and the first is p-hacking or using analytical flexibility in order to get your result underneath the magical 0 0.05 threshold. Uh, and the other issue, of course, is publication bias, in which non-significant results are not reported. And those are the two things I'm going to be addressing uh, here in this presentation. This is a illustration which is commonly used when it comes to the levels of evidence. I'm going to come back to this, and this isn't necessarily correct, but it's what's often used. So I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about it. But essentially, meta-analysis sits on the top of this pyramid. At the very bottom is case reports. I guess below that is your friend's opinion on Facebook. But it goes up and up and up. Uh, up until we get to what many people recognize or what many people think is the top of this evidence pyramid, which is meta-analysis. A lot of people use meta-analysis when it comes to deciding uh, what they think or how they're going to apply uh, a, a particular research question in different research fields. And governments also use this when it comes to how they decide policy. So meta-analysis holds a lot of sway. So I think it's especially important that we reduce these questionable research practices in meta-analysis. And the thing is, a lot of people don't go into meta-analysis and say, I'm going to do questionable research practices. A lot of these things are, are, not, are, not, are not explicit. So it's important to put, a, to put practices in place because the, the hardest, the, the, one of the easiest people to fool is yourself. And a lot of people, when they think about meta-analysis, when, when they think about conflicts of interest, Think about financial conflicts of, conflicts of interest. And of course, that's a problem. But uh, what effect, tends to affect us more is an intellectual conflict of interest. You may have been building a research program over the past 10 years. And of course, you want a meta-analysis to say a particular thing. Or you may have a particular idea that you want to push. So it's important to recognize that alongside financial conflicts of interest, we also have intellectual conflicts of interest. So there are certain things that you can put in place when you are running your meta-analysis to limit that kind of bias. So speaking of bias, let's just say we were running a study and that in that study or for that meta-analysis, we wanted to ask the question, does coffee consumption improve um, uh, cognitive function? Of course, that's important. I've got my coffee here. Um, but let's just say that you're running this study, yet you're being paid by Starbucks. There's an obvious conflict here. Or, or let's just say you looking at coffee and ca caffeine consumption and cognitive function has been your research question or your research field for the past 10 years. There's a lot of potential for analytical flexibility. So to show you this, we're going to do something which I don't recommend, but uh, for the purposes of demonstration, I think it's cool, is to do some explicit p-hacking. And there's a really cool website to, to do this. So we're going we're gonna to switch across to this website here. Uh, just Google p-hacker app and you can get to this website. So let's just put this in. Let's just say coffee is our experimental group, control group, um, 30 participants per group. Um, Cohen's D of 0.2, let's just say, um, and four dependent variables. So we can run this. We can run a new experiment. It's doing its thing. 
Okay, so we've got this study here and oh, it's, it's not significant. And we've got uh, four different dependent variables. And, uh, but what we can do is, um, let's, let's, let's just say we really wanted to get this, this result and we we're looking at the data, we can say, oh, wow, we have some outliers here, okay? So we have our coffee group, which seems to be, um, there seems to be a pattern for improving cognitive function, um, but the, these pesky outliers seem to be removing this, this effect. So if we click on, the, oh, look, if we remove one outlier, um, we have a significant result here. What happens if we remove a second outlier? Click on this. Things are getting better. That p that p value is shrinking. So there are ways that you can actually remove this, and um, there are other ways that you can p hack, for instance. So let's just say, oh, what happens if we control for age? Things things seem to improve. Control for gender. There we go. Not 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 much not much action there, um, but there there are a number of, a number of different ways that you can pay hack. But one of the things um, which seems to really really help when it comes to your pay hacking is by removing outliers, and this can be a particular problem for meta analysis. In that, for instance, you might have um, a particular uh, set of criteria for what studies you're including in your meta analysis. You may look at that and you may go, wow, there is a big outlier here, which is affecting my results. You might then go, well, looking at that outlier, maybe that study is, um, is an outlier for a reason and it shouldn't have been eligible in the first place. And then you would shift your eligibility criteria and then bam, you have a significant result. So if you don't pre-specify ahead of time, then there are ways, then you can you could potentially be biased when it comes to choosing what studies are included in your meta-analysis. So check out that p-hacker app as a way of seeing how easily that your, your analytical decisions can affect your results if you don't pre-specify them ahead of time. So there are hundreds of these decisions when it comes to meta-analysis or when it comes to any type of meta-analysis. So it's important to pre-specify them. So there's a few different reasons why you should pre-register your meta-analysis. Uh, it improves the confidence of your findings for your readers, especially if you have a conflict of interest, be it financial or intellectual. And it's really good because it becomes a part of your planning process and you can sit down and carefully think about what you're going to be, what, what you're going to be doing for your meta-analysis. The other thing is it helps avoid duplication. There's a few different meta-analysis registries and before you actually embark on one, it's always good to check whether someone else has been working on the same thing. Meta-analysis done well can take quite a long time, uh, but somebody might be a year ahead of you and uh, might be around the corner from actually presenting their results. So by pre-registering your analysis, um, you can actually, uh, other people can actually check whether um, that they're about to do something as similar as you. So that's another uh, important thing. Uh, it can also uh, help establish precedence for who actually started working on a project first. Now, one thing that's really important to emphasize is that you are not locked in to what you originally specified. It is okay to change your plans. I've done this a lot with my meta analysis. You can think ahead and you can try and plan and plan and plan. But when you actually get the data in, you realize, wow, I didn't consider this important factor. And that's totally fine to include, but you have to be very explicit and transparent when you're reporting your meta-analysis about what has changed, uh, what has changed from your original plan. So don't think that you can't change your plans. You just need to be explicit about what plans were changed when you're reporting your meta-analysis. There's a few different places where you can register your meta-analysis. If you have a biomedical outcome, Prospero is a, a great website because it walks you through your pre-registration uh, or your protocol registration step by step. Uh, takes about maybe half an hour to do, but you can walk through and you can and you, and you can register that. But keep in mind though, it's only you can only do this for biomedical studies. Another option is writing a systematic review and meta-analysis protocol. There's a number of journals which do accept this. Most journals within the BMC family um, do this kind of format and you essentially write up your protocol and this is great because your protocol gets peer reviewed um, so as well as actually registering what you're going to do, you actually get peer review and you actually get feedback on your protocol. So this is nice. It's an extra publication. People do cite protocols. I think I've published 
two or three of these protocols and they managed to get citations, uh, which is surprising, but which, which is fine. Uh, but the downside with doing this is that it can take anywhere from six weeks to a year for your protocol to go through the peer review process. So if you have a time, this is good. But if you don't have time, um, then it's something to consider. Um, the other thing you can do is a registered report meta-analysis. So this is a little bit similar, except uh, what happens here is that you uh, pre-specify your plans, uh, much like you would do for a protocol, and then a journal reviews it. And then they provide in principle acceptance of your meta-analysis regardless of the results. So you propose your introduction, you do your methods, and then you submit that. And then the reviewers review it and the editors look at that. And if they agree that the methods are strong, <clears throat> then they will, ex they will provide in principle acceptance for when you eventually finish your meta-analysis. About 250 to 300 journals now accept the registered reports format. Not all of them do meta-analysis registered reports but um, uh, a, a big percentage does. So I would look into that as a potential option. Um, and a final option or another option is posting your protocol to open science framework, which is fast and which is instant. And it doesn't matter what research field that you're in. So you can put your protocol together, put your hypotheses together, your inclusion, exclusion criteria, and you can simply post it instantly to open science framework. You can get a DOI and then you can cite that in your eventual, eventual paper. And it is time stamped as evidence of your pre-specification for your meta-analysis. Now, when it comes to actually performing the meta-analysis, there are two things essentially that are required. You need to calculate an effect size or extract an effect size and calculate its variance. Uh, for, for one example, uh, for instance, uh, Pearson's R is an effect size that you can extract, but because Pearson's R is not normally distributed, you need to convert it to Fisher's Z. And um, there's a lot of uh, other sort of effect sizes that you can pick and these need to be converted as well. Uh, so for this example, we're going to be looking at correlation. Um, and some software packages automatically provide these conversions if you plug in your Pearson's R statistic. Uh, but there are other ways. Now, generally speaking, or th th there are two primary ways to perform your meta-analysis. One is to fit a fixed effect model. Now, with these fixed effects models, you can only make inferences about the studies included in the analysis. So you can't actually make a broad uh, a broad conclusion, but you can only talk about what uh, what the, the the summary effect size would be for the studies included there. Uh, and this model um, does not assume that the true effects are homogenous. This, this is something. This is a, a common misconception with fixed effects models, but that's not the case. Now, with a random effects model, uh, with a random effects model meta analysis, you can actually make inferences about a larger set of studies from which the included studies are a part of, and Generally speaking, they're, they're usually recommended. If you're not sure which one to choose, I would go towards a random effects model. But there are some circumstances where using a fixed effects model would be justified. But if you're unsure, go for the random effects model. To give you an example of how to extract data from a study, uh, here's one example study here. And within this table, table six, um, there are the two uh, important bits of data that we need. Um, this is a website which um, which provides effect size conversions. And essentially here, all we're doing is we are including the effect size of interest, which is minus 0 0.187. And we're also entering in the sample size. And from here, we can extract the two important bits of information we need for our meta-analysis, which is a Fisher Z score and its variance. Um, you can also... Um, just as, as an example, if you want to practice yourself, you can uh, go to this paper and you can extract these things to just to see and to do a bit of practice. But there's a few different ways you can do this. But here, here is a good example of a website that can actually do those extractions there. Now, let's look at, um, to see how this actually looks in practice, we can, um, uh, we, can, we, we can extract and we can put it in and we can actually see within this forest plot that um, that is the exact correlation that we're putting in for, for, our, for our study. One question is, well, what if the data hasn't been reported? Uh, one thing you can do is you can uh, contact the author and ask them, hey, I'm doing this meta-analysis. This data isn't reported. Do you have the data? Can I use it? And can I include a few meta-analysis? Um, in my experience, if the paper has been written at least within the past 10 years, 
and you email with that question, uh, at least 50% of people will get back to you. And of that, maybe 50% of those people will actually have the data. But if you have the paper, in many circumstances, you can actually directly extract the data from the paper, especially if you're dealing with scatter plots. So I wanna give an example here. Here is a paper which was reporting the levels of oxytocin in cerebrospinal fluid and its correlation with age. I think this was in macaques from memory from this particular paper. So let's just say that for this paper, I was interested in this, in this correlation, yet it wasn't reported. You can actually extract this by using this cool software called Webplot Digitizer. So with this software, let's just load up uh, a particular image. I'll load up this image. Uh... Okay, we are dealing with a 2D XY plot. So first thing we need to do is to tell Webplot Digitizer what the axes are to give it a point of reference. So we need to specify uh, two points or four points starting with the y-axis. So we'll put something right there and look at the window at the top right. It zooms in. So here, first one, second one, third, and fourth. We could click complete. Okay, so point one is 120, point two is 60, this point is 11, and this point is 21. So now we've calibrated this. And then all we need to do is select each point like this. I'm doing this a little bit quickly. Um, you might want to be a little bit more precise about where the points are. Um, but all you do is select these things. Of course, this one's a little bit easier because there's not that many overlap between points. There we go. And there is our data. And we can uh, we can export that into a, into a CSV file. Easy peasy. There's an example there. Um, now, in this particular study, um, this the, the data was reported. So what we can do is we can actually compare um, the Webplot Digitizer with what was um, what was actually reported in the paper. So we can we can see here that um, there was um, it was extremely close between what we got from Webplot Digitizer and uh, what was reported in the paper. And uh, I've done I've done this a few times validating it, and um, it's almost always the same as long as the scatter plots that don't have too many overlap as well. So that's a really good way of actually extracting the data uh, from your particular study. When it comes to um, setting up your your data set for analysis, um, for, for, a, uh, for a correlational meta-analysis, typically you would have one column which would have the number of participants, the second column, the Pearson's R correlation. And then here we can actually see um, we've, we've done our calculation. So for instance, um, and normally I do my meta-analysis in R, but um, a lot of people don't know how to do R, use R, and that's fine. You can actually do a transparent and reproducible meta-analysis in different software, which I'm, which I'm about to show you. So within R, you can automatically calculate the effect size and its variance. Um, but here, what we're going to be doing is, um, for instance, you could actually do the same thing in that website that I showed you previously, and we've calculated the effect size and the effect size variance. So we've got this data set and which I've um, uploaded. I'm gonna um, look at the links in the video notes. And then within JASP, um, we're gonna be, what, what you can do is, um, we'll, we'll load this up soon, but I'll, I'll, I'll walk through it, is you enter in the effect size, the effect size standard error, and we're gonna get these statistics here. So let's go to JASP. Okay, so we've loaded our file, which is, the, which is, which is called MD. And we're going to click on the meta-analysis module and we're going to do a classical meta-analysis. So we have our measure of effect size and our measure of variance. And we are doing, it's running the numbers, it's doing the analysis. Let's 
going to have a, a few look at these options here. Okay, so web analysis. So looking at the overall um, effect, um, the estimate was 0.156, and this was significant. But to actually see what it looks like, we can actually construct a forest plot, which summarizes and visualizes what these effects are. We're also going to click on this. What are the settings do we have here? Okay, so it's doing its thing. We're doing a regression test for, for funnel plot asymmetry as well. I'm going to get back to that, to what that actually tests. Okay, so we have our plot here. Keep in mind, I have Jasp on dark mode, but you can change it to light mode as well. That's why the, for <laughs> that's why the forest plot is black. Um, but we can see the... Um, the, the the plot here and we have a range of different effect sizes um uh noticing that there is um the confidence intervals vary the wider the confidence interval generally um the 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 lower the number of participants in the study and then we have our summary effect down here 0.16 and it is significant um we can also look at our funnel plot here which plots um a measure a measure of effect size um against a measure of standard error as well and the other thing we've calculated is a regression test for funnel plot asymmetry. Quite often, people will look at these funnel plots and eyeball and go, well, this seems to look like there is some asymmetry there in that there's a lot of effects um, which, which don't seem to be, uh, which seem to be asymmetric. But these funnel plot, um, the, the Eggers regression test provides an objective measure of funnel plot asymmetry. So quite often, this is misinterpreted as evidence for publication bias, um, but that's not accurate. Um, so, uh, funnel plot asymmetry or, or the regression test for funnel plot asymmetry looks at small study bias, which can include publication bias, but can also include um, other forms of bias as well. So all you can all you can, can conclude with this um, Eggers regression test for funnel plot asymmetry is whether there is or there isn't or there is or there isn't evidence for uh, for for, for um, small study bias as well. So we have our we have our meta analysis here. Um, because this is a JASP file, so say this is all we're doing, we can upload this JASP file um, as a supplement to a paper or to Open Science Framework, and anybody can access the data and rerun the analysis themselves. They don't even need a copy of JASP. Um, all the data, all the output is there, but if they have JASP, then they can run the file as well itself. So uh, unlike other forms of software, um, such as comprehensive better analysis, which is expensive, um, if you're reporting that, there's no way for people to verify your analysis. But if you're using software like JASP, you can run your analysis and that you can post that as part of the paper and people can verify that as well. So, um, uh, the, the other thing to consider is selecting a residual heterogeneity estimator. Um, by default, um, the restricted ML is uh, tends, tends to be the one which is used the most. Um, in most circumstances, there isn't too much difference between these estimators, but if you're not quite sure what to do, just stick with restricted uh, ML or the restricted maximum likelihood. Now, talking about heterogeneity, so this looks at how much effect sizes vary in a meta-analysis. So looking here, we can actually see that uh, there is a lot of difference between these effects here, and this is reflected by the test of residual heterogeneity. Uh, high heterogeneity um, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It can help identify subgroups within your study. Uh, but if you have very high heterogeneity, this may suggest um, that you're pulling together studies which have very little in common. So it's, it, there, there's no blanket rule here. You have to understand your, you have to understand the research field that, that, that you're doing your analysis in. One measure of uh, heterogeneity is I squared, which is the percentage of uh, variability in effect sizes that's not caused by a sampling error. The good thing about this metric is that it's easy to interpret. It goes from zero to 100%. And rules of thumb do exist for what constitutes small, a low, moderate, and substantial heterogeneity, 25%, 50%, and 75%. 
Uh, another commonly used measure of heterogeneity is tau squared, which was reported in our JASP output, as we can see here. Uh, and this looks at between study variance using our heterogeneity estimator of choice. We used restricted ML. Now, this is harder to interpret, but it's not as sensitive to the number of studies, unlike I squared. So, my recommendation would be, and other people's recommendation would be, to report both tau squared and I squared. Now, coming back to this idea of publication bias, um, previously I showed you this pyramid of, of, of evidence, but as we know, publication bias is, is, is a massive problem. So, even if meta analysis is at the top of this pyramid, um, if it contains studies um, or if it looks at a research field which is, uh, has problems with publication bias, this isn't an accurate representation of what the true summary effect size would be because non-significant non studies haven't been reported and the significant studies, because of questionable research practices, have inflated effect sizes from what the, the, what the effect size actually is. So a better hierarchy has been proposed in which um, the, the, the top level, the best meta-analysis that you can do would be one in which it contains studies which are pre-registered as a pre-registered report in which the study, much like a pre much like a meta-analysis pre-registered report, the study is proposed beforehand and given in principle acceptance. And what's incredible is, well, it's not incredible, it's not surprising. Um, generally speaking in the literature, I think about five to 10% of studies, reported studies are non-significant. But once, once you actually have registered reports, I think about 70%, 70 to 80% of registered reports are non-significant. So there's a massive gap between these findings here. To my knowledge, there's only been one or two meta-analyses that have been run purely on registered report studies. So even though this is the gold standard, until more studies that have been done in registered report format have been done, um, it, uh, it's still a long way off. But there are ways that you can actually um, uh, look at publication bias within meta-analysis. Like, like I said before, looking at funnel plot asymmetry is not an accurate way of looking at publication bias. Um, like I said, some, some people simply eyeball these forest plots. Uh, uh, sorry, I eyeball these funnel plots going, oh, look, it looks asymmetrical. But once again, bias can creep in. The other option is using the more uh, objective Eggers regression test. Uh, so like we've done here, we've got, we've, we've got this non-significant Eggers regression test. Um, but like I said, it only measures small study bias. Um, and it, it would, which can include um, other aspects such as different research designs. So there are other methods that are needed to directly assess publication bias. There have been a few that have been proposed um, over the years, in, which you may have heard of, including pet peas, P curve, the test of excess significance, and the replicability index. Um, these uh, are all uh, nice approaches, but all of them assume low heterogeneity and in some cases are not robust and most meta-analyses don't have low heterogeneity so these approaches are not going to give you they're not necessarily going to give you accurate results one method which has um which has come up more recently or which has been popularized more recently is this idea of selection models and by doing this you give more weight to studies in intervals with a lower publication uh, probability uh, and this can actually detect publication bias even with high heterogeneity so unlike these previous methods these in, within simulation studies um, and within other studies have actually demonstrated that even in situations with high heterogeneity it can more accurately index publication bias so it's possible to to do this uh, within JASP so let's have a look here so what we have to do is we have to select uh, selection models here and this one actually does the automatic conversion for you. Um, let's just have a look. Okay, so we have to switch to correlations in N. So this does the automatic um, uh, conversion. So all you have to do is actually put in the correlation, which is this here, and the number, which is here. So now it is doing the calculations. Yep, and we're gonna do a plot here.
Okay, so this runs two different tests the publication bias. One, assuming homogeneity, and one, assuming heterogeneity. Uh, as we can re remember previously, um, this that there is a lot of e evidence for heterogeneity, and it reruns the test here. So we're gonna do we're gonna go with uh, assuming heterogeneity. Um, and so the this demonstrates that there is actually evidence here. So previously, using the funnel plot, we would say, or using uh, Egger's regression test, we would say, well, Egger's regression test wasn't significant, so there wasn't evidence of publication bias. Um, but when we actually look, we do this explicit test of publication bias, um, we can actually see uh, with this test here that there is evidence of publication bias. Um, but what's really interesting is that if you were to rerun the analysis, or if, if you do, if you if you to were to adjust the analysis um, based on this uh, assuming uh, publication bias, we can actually see. So previously, our random effects model was around 0.15, and you would you would conclude that there is an overall significant effect. However, once you actually adjust it for publication bias, the effect is no longer there. So this is a great test because it does two things. Firstly, it detects the presence of publication bias, and secondly, it adjusts your effect size for publication bias. So we can see the differences here between the non-adjusted and the adjusted analysis. So it's a very, very handy tool. There's also the alternative of looking at uh, Bayesian meta-analysis and Bayes factors are, are really interesting, provide a very interesting alternative to frequentist meta-analysis in that you are, you're actually comparing the relative evidence for an alternative model compared to a null model. If you get a non-significant result within a frequentist framework, it is difficult or it is impossible, in fact, to actually determine whether it's due to evidence for a null hypothesis or whether your sample was simply too insensitive, as in there wasn't enough participants. But if you're doing Bayesian hypothesis tests, you can actually look at the relative evidence for a null model against or compared relative to um, uh, uh, an alternative model. And the nice thing about base factors is that they're much more intuitive. Um, with, 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 with frequentist analysis, you have to have essentially a p-value and then you have to have a measure of effect size and then you have to interpret what, what that effect size actually means. But with base factors, they're very intuitive because you can simply say the, there is three times more ev evidence relative for, for, for an alternative model relative to a null model, or there is 13 times more evidence for a null model compared to an alternative model. It's really nice. So we can run a Bayesian meta-analysis as well by plugging in the same sort of data and we can actually see, so for instance here, uh, running a random effects model, um, there is uh, 32 times more evidence for the alternative. Um, hypothesis in that there's a relationship between these two factors than the null hypothesis. So let's just uh, run this. Going back to meta-analysis, Bayesian meta-analysis. We have our effect size here, our effect size standard error. And we are running it and this, this is going to give us the same results. So while that's running, We'll go back here and we can see, looking at our random effects, there is 32 times more evidence. So that, that is much more intuitive than doing the actual p-value where it says, okay, there's, there's, there's a significant relationship here. We can actually say there's 32 times more evidence for the alternative hypothesis relative to a null hypothesis. It's very nice. If you are interested in Bayesian hypothesis testing for, uh, for, for, for primary research, I would recommend checking out this primer that I co-authored a few years ago, which walks you through using JASP how to calculate base factors for your analysis. Now, there's a few different things to consider when pre-registering your own study. You have to think about the exclusion criteria. Um, are you just going to limit it to English? Um, are you going to go to different languages as well? If you have people on your team that speak different languages, that's great because you can open up the scope of your analysis. The other question is doing, are you only going to include published or peer-reviewed studies or, or non-peer-reviewed studies, which is the so-called gray literature? This would include thesis, theses, um, and preprints. I would re recommend including the gray literature. Um, always be a little bit more expansive because you can always run a, moder a moderator analysis later on comparing the effects of your peer-reviewed studies versus your non-peer-reviewed studies as well. 
And another thing to consider is the year of publication, which you can include as a moderator. You have to think about the search terms that you're going to be using as well, um, too broad, and you're going to have like uh, thousands and thousands of studies too narrow, and you're going to miss studies. So think carefully about this. I'd highly recommend working with your local academic librarian to actually get pick the appropriate databases, but also put together search term strings. This is their job. They're very good at this. I would talk to them. And uh, in, in fact, it is, it is recommended within the... Um, within the, the, the Prisma framework to actually speak with an academic librarian in order to, um, to, to get these search terms down. Uh, if you think about whether you want fixed or random effects, your heterogeneity estimator and how you're going to assess publication bias. So there's a lot of considerations for when you pre-register your own study and whether you're doing frequentist or Bayes, you can even do both if you want. Um, uh, I have in the past just on frequentist, but now I'm actually looking at integrating uh, Bayesian meta-analysis as well, because it's very compelling that you can actually, um, if you do get a non-significant result, you can look at the relative evidence for the no a null model against an alternative. Uh, it's very easy to create a pre-registration on, uh, on Open Science Framework. So you simply just create a new project. Um, you work on a pre-registration document. It could just be a Word document. Um, make a title, add some information. And then within your within your project, you can add a wiki with some information there. Um, and um, you can actually, if you're working with collaborators, it's, it's, it's super easy to actually see who's working on what because it's, uh, it's all documented there. Now, by default, these projects are private, but as soon as you're finished with your registration, you can make it public and it's timestamped and it's there and it can be referred to as well. Uh, it's very easy to also version control your files. So for instance, you might've done your first draft uh, for your protocol and you realize, oh, I've forgotten something. And as long as your file name is exactly the same name, if you upload it, it'll just recognize it as file too. So it's a very good way of actually tracking both for yourself, but also for potential readers as well. Uh, now, this has just been a very quick overview of how to do a transparent meta-analysis, but there's a ton of resources out there to learn how to do this better. Uh, one book, one free book that I'd highly recommend is this doing Meta analysis in our book. This 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 is this is a fantastic resource. It's a I'm not sure if it's available yet uh, as an actual hard copy book, but it is available for free online. So I'll check it out. Um, any questions that you can't an answer from Googling, um, I'd highly recommend the R meta analysis mailing list. This is a fantastic resource with a community of people that um, that uh, really knowledgeable when it comes to meta analysis. I've actually asked a few questions here as well. And within a, within a day or two, I had some I had some really helpful responses. So if there's any questions that you can't get from Googling or from textbooks or from speaking to colleagues, I'd recommend first searching the archives and mailing list, but then also um, uh, posting a question there. Uh, Twitter is a fantastic resource for learning stuff about meta analysis. Sometimes I throw a question out there and I'll get responses very quickly. And if you are unfamiliar with using Twitter, especially as being a scientist. I've actually written a free book that you can access online, Twitter for Scientists at t4scientist.com, which walks you through how to use Twitter and also includes a one month boot camp on using Twitter and things to suggest and prompts for posting things on Twitter. I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, I'm on various social networks, so let's stay connected. Let's talk about meta-analysis. My DMs are open on Twitter, my direct messages. And you can also send me an email if you have any questions. And I also got a podcast. I co-host a podcast, Everything Hurts. And uh, we talk about research methodology, occasionally meta-analysis as well. So check those things out. Thanks for listening. And um, I've got other videos as well on meta-analysis if you are interested too. So check them all out.